Hello, dear friends. My name is Meeta Dani, and I'm an international watercolor artist, founder and president of Global Association of Watercolor Artists, and author of the book Realistic Watercolor Unleashed. As promised, today we have the Angus McEwen. He's not only a famous watercolor artist, but he's so good in oil paints too. And he's a well-renowned world-class artist. And if you don't know about him, you can check out his website. It is full of credentials. And he's such an achieve achieved artist that if you don't know about him, I probably think that you should leave art in that place. <laughs> So welcome, Angus, and you can introduce you. yourself and let people know a lot about yourself. Hi, Mita. Thanks for uh, inviting me to this interview. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some thoughts with you. Um, starting off, if you don't know what I did, um, I, I've been painting for oh, quite a long time. I graduated in 1988 from college. And I did a, a long kind of career at college. I, I was two years doing graphics, four years doing painting, and then a postgraduate year doing painting and, and printmaking. And that really set me up for my career. But it's something I've been wanting to do since I was five years old. I've been wanting to be an artist since I was wow. since I could go to school. So everything I did at school was to, to get to art school, to be an artist, and it's all I ever wanted to do. So I've been completely driven forever, as far as I can remember, uh, to be a painter and to be an artist. And that, therefore I treat it really seriously. It's, it's my kind of uh, passion. That's what I want to do. So you are very clear about what you wanted to do and you just went for it, right? And your parents yeah. also supported, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you, you need supportive parents. And, and my parents were happy to indulge my uh, interests. <laughs> Um, and my father used to take me to, to see exhibitions when I was really young and, uh, you know, we would uh, go to the art college to see the work. And I remember going there as a 13, 14 year old thinking, wow, this, these guys are so good. I this can never do this. Um, but eventually I got there and, and I did it. And, um, and you know what? I'm still improving. I'm still getting better. Um, it's a never-ending journey, right? Learning yeah. is a never-ending journey. You, we can never yeah. stop learning. There is always a yes. stop to improve. You know what? And you can you can learn from everyone. You know, you you can't um, assume that just because someone has has been painting or hasn't been doing for something for a while. Some of my students, you know, they do things, and I I see them and I say, oh, how did you do that? And they they explain it to me and I say, oh, really? I didn't realize you could do that. So I, I still learn from my students. I learn from everybody. And I think, I think as soon as you start to think you know all, you're, you're, you've had it, I think, personally. Yeah. Then you think that you have learned everything that is the end of your growth. Yeah. Well, you, if, you, if you believe that uh, you know everything there is to know, um, there's a certain arrogance there that uh, you're beyond everybody's help. And um, I, for me, I, I'm learning all the time. I'm forever evolving, forever changing, um, forever experiencing new things. And uh, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I know it all because I know I don't. In fact, the more I do this, the more I, I realize I know very little. <laughs> just... Exactly. Exactly. You just spoke what I feel like. Sometimes my students do so well that I'm surprised that you know how they are doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, the students, you know, a lot of these people are coming to, to learn because they're interested in art and they're interested in, in, and they have a certain amount of facility in learning and, and drawing and painting. And uh, you're just there to guide them and mentor them and to kind of help them along the road. And you're just part of their little their journey, you know, you're just a little part of it, is the way I feel. Angus, when you started your professional career, at what age? Um, I, I was... 24 when I graduated from college, 25 I did postgrad. I then left uh, art college and I did, I set up myself and another artist set up uh, a company where we were, we were working with the architects and interior designers and we would um, um, do commissioned pieces. And within a year we set up our own gallery and we, we showed other artists work and at the same time we were doing commissions. And it was really ambitious. And at the time, uh, we didn't have any money behind us because we were just, we were students and we were quite poor. And 
when work was kind of drying up and it was difficult to kind of get uh, sales, uh, we found it very difficult because we didn't have that kind of uh, any money behind us. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the end it floundered and I, I went, then went off to work in a museum. And I worked in a museum and art gallery, hanging their works, uh, restoring their works. Um, and I did that for about five years. Um, and I learned a lot about showing work and exhibiting and hanging and all of that has become another side of, of what I do when I'm during exhibitions uh, in like real exhibitions and not just online exhibitions where I have to hang exhibitions and I've been a jury for the, the RSW, which is the Royal Scottish Society of Painters and Watercolours. I've uh, juried them, um, been a convener quite a few times and um, you need an eye and you need to know what you're doing because you've got maybe four or 500 paintings to hang yeah. and you have two days. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. At that time, yeah, when, when you're going through those hard times when like the money was coming on and off, and you were not totally settled. Did you ever felt that uh, you should leave art and do something else? You know, uh, often that kind of goes through your head. You think, am I, am I, do, you know, am I just banging my head against the wall? Um, should I be doing something else? It'd be much easier to just get a job and work full time and relax and not worry about the money. And that's not really who I am. It's I'm an artist and. I'm lucky enough that people around me are, are willing to support me in that. And uh, because it, it kind of ebbs and flows, you know, sometimes it, it, things are great. It's sort of famine or, or feast, you know? So sometimes you, you don't, you go months without selling any paintings and then you can, you can then have an exhibition sell out and, and have lots of money. And so you have to kind of, you have to kind of um, basically try and judge once you do get lots of money that you don't spend all at once, that you kind of, that'll allow you to kind of coast right through the lean times and um, do other things. You know, I find myself selling prints or, or teaching or whatever to kind of get me through these lean times um, so that I still can continue, continue to paint. So even when I worked in the museum, I worked full time for five years, I would come home at night and paint for a couple of hours every night. And I did that for five years. I just kept painting. I felt I needed to, to just keep doing that. So even when I worked full time, I never stopped painting. It was uh, continuous. It is really good to know that, you know, you struggled quite hard, but never gave up. Like, you know, the thought that comes into our mind when we are struggling is to give up. Yeah, yeah. Although it came to your mind and it is common, like it comes to everyone's yeah. mind, but the person who this is a this is something everyone should learn from uh, good watercolor artists like renowned watercolor artists that they are at this position because although they faced hardship but they never gave up so you know yeah. giving up is very easy and uh, continuing is difficult i'm not yeah. saying that uh, very easy for uh, means giving up is easy for everyone maybe it is difficult for you to give up art and do something else but finally, if you give up, you will not get that final result, isn't it, Angus? Yeah, I mean, even when I when I go on holiday and stop for a week, I start to get a little bit kind of anxious about I need to be working. And so even when I'm on holiday, I'll, I will find an hour to go out in the morning or at night to do a little bit of painting just to, to just keep me going. And I think, I don't actually think I could physically give up. I think I would, um, it would really affect me. You know, it would become quite probably impossible to live with. <laughs> I it, kind of need. It would have made you sad from inside, isn't it? Yeah. Because you gave up your childhood passion of becoming yeah. an artist. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. even if you would have earned money, <clears throat> you would not have been a happy person. Which is yeah. matters. Which matters. I mean, I, I think it's important to to be hungry. It's important to to not have it all kind of because I've seen. People who have um, had a, you know, early on they've had success, and it doesn't do them any good. Sometimes they actually um, relax, and then they start repeating themselves because they think that's this, you know, they need to do that to be successful, and they actually they don't they don't grow. And I actually do think you need that hunger to keep driving you forward, and it might be literally hunger, or it might be you know just that you need 
people to to kind of um, acknowledge what you're doing is okay and that, that you need to people to kind of um, like your work but but there's a hunger there to show your work and to work and to develop um, and I think that's actually really important I think uh, if, if it's too easy and you uh, you're too comfortable, you actually relax within yourself and stop working so hard. Really, so I, 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 I agree with you completely. Yesterday, I, I would like to uh, share something here. Like yesterday, I was uh, watching, uh, I rarely watch TV nowadays, but yesterday I was spending some quality time with my family and we were watching a movie based on the life of uh, soldiers and you know the people who are commandos right mm -hmm. so uh, i was watching uh, that type of a movie and i could feel that you know they are not getting a lot of money for becoming yeah, commandos yeah. and all that not every country is giving them a lot of money for joining um, you know army and all that but they mm -hmm. are so willing to do it they are doing it from inside and they are struggling so hard to learn those skills and that is physical challenge right and mm. then that is a mental challenge also because they have got families they have got kids but still they are going and facing the fear of death which is the biggest yeah. fear biggest ever yeah. fear and then fear of leaving their uh, family forever yeah. you know maybe yeah. they will never be able to meet their family but still they are so passionate about their work and then you know i feel that that is the type of passion which we need to get the success in any type of field i really believe yeah. that you know and i feel that artists specifically a lot of artists nowadays they don't have that type of killing passion which keeps them you know which, which, there is a burning passion from inside to yeah, do yeah. something good that is not there they just many of them i'm not saying everyone but many of them they just try to participate in some contest and when they their painting is on the in the walls of some particular international contest they feel very happy and achieved to get those certificates but actually they don't bother a lot in learning the skills yeah. They are not having that dying passion. Like just few minutes back, I was talking to a lady and she said that she's uh, working as an artist from 2009 onwards and she's doing it on and off. This, this on and off thing, that is yeah. something which is very dangerous. So when you are doing something on and off, it is very dangerous. Well, you just don't progress. If you do, if you do something, I've said to my students, you know, you're, you're working away and you'll get better the more you work the faster you'll get better right. and if you stop for any length of time you don't stand still you drop backwards right. so if you're stopping and starting you're just never progressing you are just right. keep dropping back and go forward and then drop back and, and you need to keep progressing even a little bit every day you will progress yeah and artists basically they have nowadays they are in a so hurry to achieve success and all that they want they are craving for instant gratification whoever whichever organization says that oh i am going to promote you i'm going to do this i'm going to do that for you and just come and submit any work okay and they the organizations are also like taking advantage of this type of feeling among mm -hmm. artists that you know they accept the money and they display their painting without caring a lot about the quality there are many organizations who are doing that they are not yeah. uh, taking the quality work they are just hanging the paintings of those people who are ready to pay the money so whoever I, is I rich think, yeah i think you know people will will learn there, there'll be a stage there'll be you you apply you know you'll get into certain places you'll be able to hang and then they'll, they'll, they'll get tired of that and then realize actually i need to be if i want to be in an organization that's looking at quality then then I need to move on. I need to move up into another organization that's going to respect quality. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm a member of, of a member of a, um, an organization in London and there, there is only 50 people in the whole world. So if you get accepted into that, there will only ever be 50. And you realize then that in the whole world that you're down to the last 50. And so therefore you realize that you know, it's, it's very difficult to get into you know not anybody can be in part of this and so 
Um, if you're in an organization where, you know, it doesn't matter whether you, as long as you can pay the dues and you can get in, it has less of an impact. It has less of a, a, a kind of prestige, if you want, than one where it's limited. And there's there's very few people can get into that. And I, I know that might sound elitist, but at the same time, it gives you something to drive towards to become better so that you can move up into higher ech echelons. There's, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a soccer player, you know, you, you maybe start off and you, you could be in the lower leagues, you want to get in the higher leagues and eventually become the superstar, because yeah. that's where all the money is. And that's where the best players are and the best players and everybody gets fetid because they are the best. And there are millions of people who are below that. And it's kind of like that you kind of want to move up and move up and move up to the point where you get where people recognize who you are and you're fetid and um, you should you know, be if, driven from inside you yeah. know, for that type I mean, of progress. Don't get me wrong, that's not the only reason for doing it, but I think, you know, it's, it's important that uh, if you're looking for kind of people to kind of look at your work and, and um, peers to kind of admire your work, then I think you should work at that and you can move on up. But some people might be quite happy to, to settle um, maybe at a, a, a different level. And again, that's fine. There, in you know, soccer, there are lots of people who are just happy being in League One, and that's fine. And they don't want to move up. They're happy where they are, they earn a living, and that's where they want to be. And they have a, a small level of, uh, of uh, respect. Um, and so for some people, that, that might be what they want. Um, for me, I, I, I'm trying to kind of improve and, and sort of push myself, push myself. And uh, I'm happy enough to push other people if they want to come along with me. <laughs> I, I, would, I would really love to ask you one question about what is the biggest challenge that you faced in your uh, a whole career? Like any, can you explain up some incidents or something which uh, really pushed you, like really tried to stop you or really try to push you hard, like, you know, where, which uh, any one incidents where you felt horribly bad about it or some incidents which made you feel that you really need to do it much better or something like that? Would you like um, to? Well, challenging, the, there are many things that, uh, that have been challenging. And I, I mentioned one of them earlier, um, I just think that there are many things that come up in life that are going to challenge you. And um, I can't actually remember what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe probably because you did not took it so seriously. You just kept going. Maybe because of that. No, no the, the, the main challenge was actually when I was starting out was trying to establish myself as an artist, that actually was the hardest bit when I came out of art school and I wanted to try and establish myself in galleries. Nobody knew who I was and I, had, I, would, I only had my degree show and things like that. And I had hardly any money. And that was, that was actually the, the most difficult point for me because um, I was at the very beginning, I was at the very bottom and I was trying to, to get recognition. I was trying to get people to kind of take me seriously. Um, and I suppose that's why I feel then being in set, so, 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 sorry, societies helps is because the, there's recognition there. There's recognition from people who are established and they're your peers and that all that helps. And I was trying to get galleries to take me seriously and to show my work. And some people will take one or two just to see how it goes. Of course, things are different now because we have the internet. Back in 1980, that that wasn't there. So I was trying to do it by going to galleries. I was taking slides and I was writing to people and sending slides to galleries. And many, many of the times it, nothing happened. They just, they didn't even send the work back. It just went in the bin. Um, and I spent a long time doing that. And that was actually the, the most challenging time for me was trying to get my foot onto the, the first step. Right. Uh, uh, do you feel that a mentor would have helped you, like a person yeah. who would have guided you? Yeah. Would have made your yeah. life easy? Because you you were just trying 
you were trying things, you'd read about it and you'd say, okay, I need to send slides, I would need to write to a gallery, but then nobody would say, okay, this is what you need to write, or this is the gallery that would be useful for you. They would just say, go and look at the stuff that's in the gallery, and uh, if you think your work would be suitable, then, then approach them. Of course, one of the galleries, I did that, and I saw somebody whose work was very similar to mine, and I approached the gallery, and they said, we've already got stuff like this. We already have the best artist who does that stuff. And so, you know, there were there were many kind of situations where I had to then eat humble pie and go back and rethink what I was doing, and and then approach because I was I was, you know, making it up. I was just trying to figure it out myself. There was nobody there to kind of help. I was out of the college system, and yeah. um, it I was difficult. I I really think that you know uh, every person needs a good main mentor and uh, the, sp the speed in which they can improve becomes much higher when they have a yeah. mentor, good mentor. Yeah. Well, it's, it means you're not making mistakes. You know, you, you re part of you're that. not making re reinventing the wheel, basically. Yeah, right, right. Making mistake, you know, making mistake is good, actually. Yeah. Because once you make a mistake, you really learn hard in, in such yeah. a way that you will never, ever forget. Yeah. And you feel confident that, okay, this is what I should not do. But, you know, life is not about every time making a mistake and doing it. takes a lot of time. We can understand from somebody else's mistake. Like, suppose I have done a mistake. I will ask my student not to do that, right? Because they can learn from my mistake yeah. instead of committing yes. the same mistake again and again. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's what the mentor is, is good for because they can offer advice and they can guide but they can't you know, force you to do anything. They can only suggest and say, this is what my experience, you can try this. Um, mm -hmm. And so a mentoring sort of situation is, is really useful, I think, um, all, at all levels. I mean, even at this level, I still ask people for advice. You know, if I want to do something, I'll still get in touch with people I respect and say, I noticed you did this. How did you do that? Because I can't figure it out. And uh, so I still, at this level, uh, I'm still looking for help. Yeah, people, same happens everywhere. Yeah, and people are, you know, if they're, they're people are nice enough, they, they will help you. Uh, to all, all the people <clears throat> who are list, watching this interview, they can add your question. And I will try to ask those questions to Angus uh, while he is here with me. And Angus, I would like to ask you another question. What is the very first uh, event or something which, which helped you to achieve a lot of fame and recognition? Um, uh, there's maybe two or three um, moments in my career that have propelled me in different directions and, and given me different sort of, what I would say, defining moments. <clears throat> One of them um, was in 1996 where I, um, I was actually doing teacher training and I had I'd left my job in the museum. I'd gone on to do uh, teacher training for a year, a postgraduate diploma. And I continued to paint right through that. And I, I entered a competition <clears throat> and it was a traveling competition and I won it. And it was a substantial amount of money. Even back in the 1980s, it was 10,000 pounds. It was wow. a lot of money. Wow. And, um, I could basically do anything. So I chose to go to China in 19, uh, sorry, it was 1996. Um, I, I chose to go to China and I went around China for three months. And while I was there, I painted. And I just backpacked, took some paints. And I, that was the first time I actually really explored watercolor. So it was the first time I'd really traveled to paint. And it was the first time I'd used watercolor while traveling. And so it, it kind of set me up for where I am now. Um, and that was, you know, 23 years ago or something. Wow. Um, and it was a, a, a huge experience, um, a, a defining moment, because it, it's basically where I am now, traveling and going to China and going to various places that, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I can do that, and painting at the same time, and, and getting lots of material and then producing work to have exhibitions. <clears throat> and it was all started at that point in 96. Another two kind of moments in my career, and, and it all seemed to come from awards. And not every award that I got produced anything. 
but in 2012, I won the Fabriano uh, uh, Award, Marquis de Aqua, and it, it allowed me to have a, an exhibition. And um, uh, I had a couple of weeks when I was there, and I was doing kind of work, and I could stay there in Fabriano, and I met lots of people, and there lots of connections came from that, and my my kind of love affair of the paper um, started at that point. Although I'd used Fabriano before that, I was, uh, I'd, I've been back many times and I really love the place. I love Italy and I love uh, that place in particular. Um, in 2013, I then had, um, I decided that I would apply to the Shenzhen exhibition, which was in China. And I was fortunate to get the bronze award. And so I decided, to go to the award ceremony. And I went there and I met many people. I met Lauren McCracken and Konstantin Sterkov and Zoe Tenya and uh, Joe Tenya and many, many people who have had a big influence on where I am now came at that point. I, all the connections I made from going to that for two or three days I was there have, have extended out into what I'm, where I am now as well. So there are the moments that I've, looking back on it, you can see that a lot of things have happened from that point forward. And it's just that I've been, been able to kind of take the opportunity and kind of run with it and to kind of use the connections to kind of help me and also vice versa, because I've helped quite a lot of people that I've met in, in lots of different ways. And I've helped them make connections as well. So it, it's kind of, a, you know, you, you're helping each other. Yeah. You know, at that level. <clears throat> but it gave me the opportunity to to meet these people. And uh, before I had just known their work and uh, had never met any of them before, only very few of them. Um, and so it was quite a, a big moment for me because I, I was able to um, you know, meet them and speak to them and find out that they had the same fears and the same hopes and the same dreams as I did. And a, a, a lot of friendships came out of that. And, um, you know, and it's getting bigger. You know, it's, it's every time I do this, it gets better. Um, I would like to add here a few things because, you know, many of the audience, they might be feeling that, okay, Angus got the money, got the award, and therefore he could travel to China. From there, he got some connections and because of that, <clears throat> he could do much more progress. And uh, maybe they are feeling that they are not so lucky or they are not, uh, having that type of opportunity and therefore they cannot do that, something like that. Maybe some of the audience might be feeling after listening to you. So I would like to tell those people who are thinking like that. So I would like to share my things. Like um, when I started, uh, my situation was entirely different and I'm a self-taught artist and uh, my uh, hands were tied with a lot of responsibilities and I, I don't think that I could have, even if I would have got a lot of money, I would never have got that opportunity to leave my kids and my family and visit another country and stay there yes. for a few months. And like my husband earns a lot, but I did not have that type of opportunity. Now also I cannot go often. You have never seen me going here and there. That's because my kids are still small. Maybe I will yes. start doing that, but uh, that is not my priority. So the thing is, uh, people who are thinking that okay angus could do that because of so and so reasons and you are not able to do it because of so and so reasons i would like to say that whenever anything like that comes in your mind stop that particular thought immediately that is going to help uh, that is going to affect you that any negative thought will affect you right I always believe that, you know, if you are not having one opportunity, try to find some other opportunities, try to create opportunities. Like for example, I wanted to know a lot about a lot of artists. So I started a global association and got a lot of opportunities to work closely with a lot many people to jury shows and, uh, you know, learn how to do, do, do the jury things and all that. And yeah. I wanted to uh, start, uh, learn deeply about Anger, Stephen, and all uh, and other artists. So I planned to write a book along with them so that I can know and understand how exactly they work, right? So you need to create opportunities instead of finding out what other people can do, which you cannot do. Okay, anything yeah. which is negative, 
try to avoid those type of thoughts i really think that it is important because you know in field of art one person who can do that usually males uh, males you know they leave their family with the wife and they can go here and there but many female artist they cannot do that because they have got a lot of family related responsibilities and they have to wait for their kids to grow up I, I to be fair I I went to China the first time I didn't have children um okay. we did, you know we, so my wife came with me so we we were able to travel together um um and now my children are you know the the youngest is 14 and the eldest is 20 and so uh we can kind of leave them for a little while um right. yeah um so it just I think a different point in your life yeah. um you can take advantage of things um right. so opportunities keep on but, coming and going and we need to create yes. opportunities rather than yeah. waiting for opportunities to come along our way and then yeah. they go forward yeah i mean i, I completely agree that the, it is different from male to female artists the, there is a different you know i've got a lot of female friends who are artists and uh, you know they the most of them their careers begin again after the children have grown up and then so they have a career before and then it, it, there's a lull and then they have a career but i don't think it's stopping you <laughs> yeah. yeah because you know uh, i am very tech savvy i know how to use technology to promote myself and to use this feature of internet and i am also teaching my students how to how they can just explore internet it is not something very difficult we yeah. always do chit chat using messenger and whatsapp and we use facebook but instead of using facebook just for chit chatting or posting selfies they can do much better and you know you can earn money through that sitting yeah. entirely at their home so many yeah. artists they believe that their location is not uh, good or they are not having international clients it is just a matter of how you think and how you work because you know i am having international clients that's because i am using facebook instagram yeah. and online stuff to uh, work in favor of me and this can yeah. be done by anybody right yeah yeah uh, if you utilize this power of internet and yeah, you know, I, I think uh, what you're doing with that is really interesting. I, I think uh, you're one of the few people who's doing it and doing it well. And, um, you know, I salute you for that because uh, it's something that kind of, it makes me kind of not worried, but, you know, I certainly kind of think, oh, can I manage that? Can I do that? You can. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully soon. Um, but, um, yeah. I think uh, the 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 fact that you've managed to take that on, I think that's amazing. I think you've done really well. I so. started uh, learning how to work on internet as an artist from a business organization, and uh, I just implemented. They did not made me learn how to do it in art field, but they yeah. just taught me how to do that. And then when I implemented the whole concept in art, I thought yeah. that this is way. This is an easy way in which any artist who is having a lot of knowledge can earn a lot of money sitting at any part of the world, just if they have knowledge, if they have internet and they have some laptop or iPad or something. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. nothing else is required. So, yeah. you know, uh, this can be a, this working on a location independent manner. That is what I'm promoting. So those who are watching this uh, interview, uh, they know that I am uh, one of the leaders of uh, boiled watercolor market, okay? And Angus is another leader of world watercolor market. And both of us are doing our best to make the market of watercolors much better in the coming days. And we are striving hard to do that. So this is for all of the viewers. And Angus, would you like to say what you are doing for this particular uh, world watercolor market improvement things. Uh, well, I'm, I'm hoping obviously to do the same as you with the online course, and um, I'm hoping it will be uh, January. It'll be beginning of the year that I'm hopefully launching it. At the moment, I've got lots of work to do, <laughs> uh, producing online content, um, videos, and things like that. So I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to put all that together. But um, you are also yeah. taking care of those. Uh, uh, tasks related to um, promoting watercolor in uh, museums, right? You are the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's interesting because um, 
you know, it, it the time where you see museum and watercolor museums is is mostly in in China. I see a lot of it in China, uh, but uh, in the Western places that you get occasionally. Here we have the Turner watercolors uh, in the National Museum, but it he's very established. You know, he's uh, a big big name, and so they're they're willing to show every year they will show the Turner watercolors uh, in the January February when it's almost quite dark, <laughs> so they won't fade. Um, but apart from that, you 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 know you won't see it in a museum setting. Uh, you'll see it in big gallery settings and big exhibitions. Um, but uh, museums uh, tend to shy away from watercolor a little bit. Um, and again, I think just I was just hinting at it. They, I think they're worried about the fact that it won't last, so they only show it uh, in the small sections of when it's very you know hardly any light. So I think I think watches. their whole thinking is outdated. I think. Do you think their thinking is yeah. outdated and they need to be retaught about the new concepts well, like, yeah. you know, plexiglass? Things are, things are and, changing. Mm -hmm. Things are changing. And I know in America, there, there's a lot of people who are um, removing glass from their paintings and they're using um, sprays to kind of uh, spray their watercolor. I'm, I'm watching with interest. I haven't gone that far yet. Um, I'm wa watching to see how that goes. Um, but I know that people are trying to overcome this kind of whole concept of, of watercolor being different to oil paint and acrylics. Um, and so there are, there are a lot of American artists who are trying to um, um, use sprays. I think Golden are doing a spray that they put across, uh, which is an acrylic spray, I think. But uh, to basically remove it and make it just look like an oil painting. Um, and I, I believe that the, the people who have been doing that have been able to uh, get more money for their paintings also because people are willing to to think they think differently about the watercolor which is bizarre yeah. but yeah i think uh, auction houses and museums these are the two markets or these are the two places which which we are focusing on trying to improve the market so when we say yeah. that we are <laughs> trying to improve the market we are trying to introduce more and more watercolors into auction houses and museums but you know that is possible only if the quality of watercolor is good so uh, it, like uh, that is why i am focusing a lot on giving quality training to upcoming artists and I'm promoting and helping them and by giving career guidance and, yeah. by, you know, by having this type of interviews with uh, world renowned artists, just because, you know, the quality of watercolor needs to be improved. And I, yeah. I feel that a lot can be done if we actually focus on giving proper training to the upcoming artist. Yeah, well, it's just like we were saying before, the, that whole mentoring thing teaching somebody and uh, it might not even be just having to teach them basics, but actually just giving them ideas and thoughts that would help improve the quality of the work. Right. Um, and so, you know, it might not just be to sort of copying this and copying that. It may be more about kind of guiding and mentoring and helping and suggesting things that would just kind of lift them into the next level. Uh, I have got a question. Uh, I cannot see that question. Okay. Okay, uh, my Facebook is behaving weird. So I got a question from Heetha. What do you mean by when you say that quality of work? So do you mean uh, what are the things you consider as a quality work? I think that was the question. I'm not able to see her question again. So for quality for me would be um, something that's drawn well, something that's painted well, the composition's good, the color's good, the application's good. They're, they're, you know, and it could be, it doesn't have to be realistic or, or abstract or whatever, it could be anything. You can tell when something's good. You can just tell when, you know, the, there's a good quality about the painting and it could be abstract, you know. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a realistic painting. It doesn't have to, you know, like look like, I don't know. An Andrew um, Wyeth or something like that. You just know I, when something's got good quality. I have got, I have got one point here for Heather. See, mm -hmm. there are 10 principles of art. And you can go and check out on Google 10 mm -hmm. principles of art, right? If you want to have a lot of quality in your painting, you need to do this few things. Okay, number one, always paint on a highest grade paper. Okay, good quality paper. Second, always invest in 
art is straight paint, higher straight paint. Okay, number three, at least minimum four principles of art you must follow in your painting so that your painting becomes a lot uh, impressive. Okay, uh, then number fourth is always focus on uh, composition, right? So find out what are the different compositional rules. There will be many, several compositional rules. You don't have to follow each and every one, but find out which are the things you like. You can check out some good works by different artists and whichever works you like the most, find out why you are liking those uh, work more. That is the inner voice of your artist, right? So you are an artist, so you have got your own choices. So you will figure out what exactly you write. Like for example, Angus likes a lot of texture. Angus always likes to have a bold color. He will hardly paint with very, very dull gray or those type of colors. Isn't it Angus? So I do, I, I do use grays, and um, but I, yeah, I work with strong colors. Yeah. Strong colors, right? So Angus <coughs> has got a specific sense of composition so he always have a central theme like no, not central theme he always have a fo strong focal point okay yeah. so you will find that in angus work there is something which you can find very very common that is a strong focal point will always be there right a lot of contrast will be there a lot of texture will be there so find out what you like what you don't like analyze that and then always Im implement at least minimum four principles of art and your painting will be fabulous okay so that is for Heatha. Uh, <coughs> just check if i have some question from other artist my question, okay, Kalpesh is asking, my question is how to start art career without any art courses? Okay, so do you have a, a Kalpesh? Uh, I did not have any art courses, but uh, you have asked it to Mac, uh, Angus, so I would like him to ask. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, I think you can do what, what we've been discussing before, which is you can read books, you can um, look at other artists' work, you can try and analyze them, you can copy them. The best way to learn sometimes is just getting a work that you really like and trying to copy it and see if you can understand what's going on. So once you understand the materials and understand what they can do, when you then look at a painting, you can immediately say, oh, he's done this, he's tried that, he's used this method. I can, I can probably guess how they could do that and I could copy it. Um, you will learn a lot from copying other artists, but it, it, it must be only uh, something that you do in it's order to learn. Here. It's not something that you do to then pass off as your own. It's just something you do to then sort of say, well, you know, I've managed to understand what's going on here. I'm going to then apply that to another subject and I will, I will then try and, and work that way. That is but, important. But, you know, because this plagiarism thing is is getting, well, it's not getting worse, It's 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 been, like that forever, but people will copy. Um, and I, I, as a student, I did it as well, but I, I did it. I mean, I would copy people like Vermeer. So anybody who saw it, you would know that it was a Vermeer I copied. But what I would do is I would change it. I would add, I, instead of the artist, I'd put myself in, or I would change it. I'd do something to it to make it slightly different. But I learned a lot from studying Michelangelo and Leonardo and Rembrandt, I, I copied. The, their techniques and their style and their methods and I, I learned a lot from doing that and so even if you can't go on a course you can analyze your favorite artists and you can try and, and copy them and um, I think you would learn quite a lot then it'll give you confidence to maybe you know going a course by yourself or you know myself or whatever to then take the next step. Right actually each and every technique of watercolor that is there on internet. There are thousands yeah. of view, yeah. videos, good videos on internet, yeah. right? So the thing is, if one really wants to learn watercolor, they don't need a, a person like you or me to <coughs> and join a course and learn watercolors. That is not required. But uh, the thing is, you have to be internally motivated, dedicated of doing it. 
Yeah. And, uh, without giving excuses, you need to do it. So if you are saying, oh, watercolor is difficult and I, I'm not able to do this and all, if you have that mindset that, you know, watercolor is difficult and I'm not able to do this, then definitely you will find it difficult. In, can I just say, hand, yeah. Can I just say that when I first started watercolor, my first year of watercolors were awful. They were terrible. And I was used to painting in oils, and I was used to painting in acrylics, and I was used to a certain standard. And I remember painting, I was in China, and I was thinking, how difficult can this be? I mean, I can paint, I can draw. Why is this not working? And it, it took part of the way through the journey before I suddenly uh, figured out how I could use watercolor. And it took a while. And it, it was embarrassing because I, there was lots of crowds behind me and I was painting away and everybody's standing looking and I'm like, <laughs> My, my early stuff was awful, but I, I persevered. And I think that's important. If you push through and keep working and uh, you will get better at it. Yeah, there are three major reasons why people find watercolor difficult is, you know, when we start with oil, I'm just giving you ex uh, differentiation of oils and watercolor. Yeah, yeah. When we start with oil, we were told that, you know, like, you know, oil, you have to use a quality canvas, you have to do the stretching and all these things, you have to apply this primer, and then you have to uh, do this first, you have to do the sketching, and then uh, mm -hmm. if you go wrong in sketching, you can always correct that, right, in oils. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. if you can paint it black, the whole yeah, canvas, yeah. and then you can paint it white, right? But mm -hmm. in watercolors, hardly any courses or hardly a lot of universities have got a good teacher where I'm not talking about each and every university, but there are lots where they don't give a very detailed knowledge about watercolors. And many times the teachers, they also have this preconception about watercolor. Watercolor should painting should look like this or that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give a lot of freedom to explore the students, yeah. right? And uh, then there is two options. In oils, when we have to purchase oil paints, they are expensive, right? And it is standard mm. and we have to purchase linseed oil, turpentine and all those things and good quality brushes and all that. And we do that, right? For watercolor, <coughs> we have got two options, cheap quality and highest grade. So the market is like that. So it is very common that a person who has got hardly any knowledge, they will of course purchase the cheap quality ones. They will purchase oh, most students do. I mean, even in oil paints and acrylics, you can get cheap versions. And, and uh, it's a it's a bane of my life that students will buy the cheapest stuff because they don't right. have any money. But I'm saying to them, you end up using twice as much paint. You right. end up because there's hardly any pigment. It's full of fillers. It's full of clay and chalk just to pad it out. And uh, you, you don't realize at the time you're thinking you're getting lots of paint. And then it takes a whole tube just exactly. to get a little bit of just color. Just half an hour back, I got a mail from my student that, you know, she has already joined my course and still she is not using highest rate paper and highest rate paint, which I told her to purchase long time back. This is the mindset, right? You, If you don't want to invest in good quality paper and materials, yeah. then you will not see the results, but they don't understand that a lot. So that is yeah. one of the reasons why the people, they don't get the results. And another thing is that, in watercolors, it is a little bit like, you know, you need a lot of planning. You need to have a very clear concept of what you want to do, what you want to achieve. You cannot just simply start and keep on doing things like, you know, when we start learning oil paint, even if we go wrong, we can correct everything and start doing again. And that is why people find oil paints easier. When we yeah. are doing it with watercolors, we need to have a planning, a solid plan. When I told my students how to create a plan and do it, they did nicely. But if you are doing it for the all by yourself, maybe you are not having that solid plan. And because of that, you are failing and finding watercolor difficult. So it is not the medium actually, which is difficult. It is what is the requirements of the medium, which you are not following. it. So watercolor needs a solid plan. And if you have the solid plan, then you will find it easier. Yeah. I, I think having a plan is easy. I mean, once you get, once you understand watercolor and understand what you can do with it, 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 it's as versatile as acrylics and oils. And you could probably do even more with it because you can draw back on top and you can use crayons and all sorts of things and chalks and whatever. 
but that's because I like adding stuff in. You know, I like kind of mixed media things, but um, it can be as versatile. But you need to you need to understand the basics first before you can you can do that. Uh, and it is tricky. Uh, it is tricky. There's no doubt. Yeah, I like I love tricky. I love things. <laughs> I love everything which is tricky. <laughs> yeah, well, it is tricky. <laughs> You know, there are few things like, you know, everyone does not like horse riding. Everyone doesn't like to be an entrepreneur. Everyone doesn't like to, you know, play with danger, right? So I love tricky things. Yeah. <laughs> I love things which are very complicated and uh, which are challenging. And that yeah. really motivates me to, you know, find out how to do this. If things are super simple, I will rather not do that. I will leave that yeah. for somebody else. Well, quite often I'll start, I'll start a drawing or a painting and I know how it's going to end and I give up on it because I know how it's going to end. There's no challenge there. You think, mm, I know what this is just going to look like. Blah. It's when when I'm, I only have half of a plan and then the rest of the areas where I am not sure how it's going to work out. That's more of a challenge for me because then right. I've got to try and solve that problem. I think that is common between you and me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's, I need a, an area where I can play with the pain and 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 explore, you know, things that I didn't expect to happen. If um, there are some textures, if there are some textures which are totally complex, and I'm really not sure how to achieve that in watercolor, I will really love to do that type of particular uh, this thing, and. Uh, sometimes I am uh, like, sometimes I think that I should try out oils also. Maybe uh, I will do that in future. <coughs> but uh, what stops me is like, I can make any color to light or to dark at any point of time. So I don't know whether it is going to be too challenging for me. And if it is not too challenging, I don't invest time in those particular things. Like, you yeah. know, I took up this... Uh, I took up this challenge of improving the world watercolor market only because I was not sure how to do that. If I'm sure of how to do it, then I would not <clears> rather <throat> go into it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there is another question for you from Suzanne Davis. She's saying finished paintings can be quite varied in size. Do you start with a finished size in mind or do you have a formula you work to when you see a subject um, you want to paint? Okay, so do you start with a finished size in mind when you see a subject? Yeah, That's when good. I see a subject, I have a good idea of what size it could be. Um, and so um, I, I would do quick sketches in my sketchbook, but uh, I have an idea if the subject's going to lend itself to being big or whether it's just going to be a small idea, a small painting. Uh, and sometimes I'll do the same image uh, at different scales. And so sometimes I'll do a small version of it and then I'll do a bigger version of it. And um, very rarely do I do the same thing, same composition again at a different scale. It's usually I change something about it, whatever it might be, the colors or the, you know, the composition a little bit, um, but I will change it. But I, I usually have a good idea in my head what's going to work at a different di okay, scales. So give some more details like you uh, you said that it gives you a good idea so what are the things you look for making a big painting <coughs> and what uh, you what are the subjects which you think that it will look in small paintings it depends on how much information is there if it, if there's a lot of information and it has a, a lot of impact then i would want to make it big because it's got a lot of impact if it's got lots of detail but it's a, it's a small thing you know maybe a door but it's it's just a small i it just to me then that's just a small painting because there, it doesn't have a huge amount of impact but if it's something strong like the my big boat piece or something like that where it's it's got lots of detail there's lots of information to be there and it has strong impact and strong colors then i know i want to do a big piece i, I want a big version of that uh, and i know also it's going to take me six months but i, I do realize that when i finish it it will have a presence um, whereas I have done small versions of that, but it it does just doesn't have the same impact. And so you you begin to learn that um, by looking at the image and uh, thinking about how much information is there and whether it has a, a enough impact, whether you want to do a large or small. Um, sometimes I just uh, think to myself, if I blow that up to a bigger scale, 
that's actually going to, to be too empty. There's not going to be enough stuff there. I need to maybe change it or alter the color or whatever. So it's, it's experience, I think. I've just, I can look at something and go, yeah, that's a small painting. And I look at that and say, no, it's a medium sized painting. Mm -hmm. um, and if, I, if I'm unsure, I'll try it at different scales. Mm -hmm. You know, I will kind of start off small and then maybe if I think, yeah, that's quite good. That might be really nice big. Then I'll do it as a bigger scale piece. Um, but it really does come down to impact and whether I think it's going to have a, a big impact at a bigger scale. Because when you're at art school, they say, make everything big. Everything's big. So seven foot paintings, eight foot paintings was the norm. What is your biggest size of watercolor painting? Um, it was probably four and a half foot or so. It went off to Australia. It was a big landscape I did. It was a commission piece and I don't very rarely do commission piece. Um, but it was uh, it was from a big roll of Fabriano and I just stretched. I, I had to buy boards specially for it because it was huge. <coughs> And they had to get specially made uh, mounts and things for it uh, to get it mounted up. But uh, I think that's probably the biggest I've done. I try now to keep to, I try actually now to keep to this uh, standard imperial, half imperial, quarter imperial, because it's just, it's actually easier for framing. I can reuse the frames. Wow. So um, I try to do that, but quite often I end up with funny shaped objects, you know, like long skinny ones or whatever, because I just think it's better. So I have two more questions for you. Okay. Angus. The time okay. is coming up and I really appreciate your time and it is coming up. It is almost one hour. So there are two questions which I have. One okay. is, uh, you know, we are, we, we are writing a book <clears throat> together with Steve yeah. Kuzar and uh, David Stickel and Mikhail Starchenko, and it is soon going to be there in the market in first half of 2020. And I'm super ambitious about that book. And this book is having the knowledge of all five artists, I being the lead author. So mm -hmm. Angus, you, uh, would you like to share a bit more about that book with the uh, people who are watching this interview? Well, you know what I think is interesting about the book is, although it's, it's about kind of realism uh, or hyper-realism in, in watercolour, is that you'll get to see the different approaches. So you, you see the finished work, but I, I reckon everybody does a different route. Everybody takes a different route to get there. And I think uh, it'll be interesting. I'm, I'm interested to see how everybody else does and gets to where they go. Uh, because I know the way I work is different to uh, lots of people. Lots of people I've seen work, they, they will paint a little bit and finish it and then paint another little bit and finish it. Uh, whereas I go around the picture and just, and it just pulls it all together. And eventually, more like an oil painter, I think, eventually I end up with the, the finished piece, which is completely different to everybody else. And I'm really interested to see how everybody else approaches it and their methods they use and, and the materials and all that sort of stuff. So I'm looking I'm forward the to it. I'm the luckiest because I'm the first person <laughs> who knows each and everything what all the artists did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. We will do this review round and then you will come to know about other people what they did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so for all the uh, people who are watching this video, this book is on realism again. And this book is not only going to tell a lot about how I paint. So I have written 70% of this book and the other authors, co-authors, they have written one, one chapter each. And this book is going to be launched in the first half of 2020, exact date, not sure yet. But uh, this is going to be an, unbeatable book in watercolors okay there is no way you can learn a lot more in watercolors than in this book because you know this is not only having my approach but it is having approach towards realism by Angus McEwan, Stephen Koza, David Stickel and Mikhail Starchenko and all these artists they are world renowned and masters in their the way they paint so you can hope that, you know, if this book is in market, you should grab it in case you want to learn a lot about watercolors. Okay, so it is not only realism that you will be learning from this book, but it is also about various techniques because, you know, if you learn about the techniques, you can implement that technique in whichever style you're painting. So it is nothing yeah. related to specifically in realism, but realism takes a lot of planning. So I feel yeah. that, you know, there are many people who don't like realism, 
So the thing is realism takes the maximum planning because if you go wrong, you go wrong. It is like that. Yeah. So it takes a lot of planning. So it is not only going to be how to paint, but it is also how to plan. A lot has been written about planning in a spe special chapter. And that is going to give you a lot of insight about how we all work. And it is not only about that. There is a um, there is a chapter by Kumar Kanchu, who is a very renowned professional photographer and from India. And he is also adding a chapter in this book. And so it is a complete book in itself. This book is going to give a tough challenge to my previous book, Realistic Watercolor English. <laughs> Let's see. Well, it's, it's completely different, I think. Yes. They are different. They are quite different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the way the whole thing is structured in realistic watercolor unleashed is totally different than the way we I have structured this particular book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is one last question. What okay. message would you like to give to the upcoming artist who are planning to start as a professional? Uh, first thing is don't give up because you're going to come across lots of problems and issues uh, when you're painting, but don't give up. Keep persevering. Um, I have lots of students who kind of they go to a certain point and then they give up, they stop, they rip it up and then they start again. And then they paint and they get to a problem pit and they never get beyond that. You need to persevere. So not just persevering with your, your whole career, but persevering with your paintings as well. Um, uh, I wrote some things down actually. That was because uh, I think it's really important. Um, be true to yourself. The, it's the one thing that I keep kind of reminding myself when I see somebody there are lots of painters out there who are really successful and really good and you think to yourself wow if only i could do a painting in 30 minutes um like just so you know so and so then uh, then i wouldn't cause so many problems for myself where i'm spending months on the one painting but actually that's not me that's just not what i'm about it's not what my painting's about and so i have to keep reminding myself no keep doing what you're doing that's you that's what you're about be true to yourself and it's something i've i've reminded myself continuously since i was at art school that not to be sidetracked by other people who are very successful and who are doing a successful thing but actually to plow your own furrow so that's another thing find your own voice so try and find uh, the way of working that's yours that's um, you can copy other people but don't you know Try not to be influenced by, I, I get to the point now that I stop going to museums and things because um, I, I sometimes find it, I look at their work and I'm influenced by it. And so I try not to even look at that so that I've got very much a tunnel vision. I know what I want and I try to kind of work that way. If I see too many uh, works, I have friends who they can paint in many different styles and they just don't know, their own voice is lost because they, they're, they're kind of looking at this and they can do that and they can do this and they can do that. And their own true voice is kind of lost and drowned out. And so you need to kind of focus and know what you're about and know what you want and what you're interested in and uh, go for it. And, you know, not to be put off and sort of persevere. Um, that was, that's the kind of main things that I would suggest for me anyway. That's a great I, I would also like to add here a few things for the listeners, and I hope that will also help you a lot. Number one, uh, just now Anger said that a person is doing uh, looking at one painting and trying to do this, another style, looking at another painting, trying to do this. Okay, if you find yourself doing the same thing, know that your style is realism. If you can look into something and do that and look into another thing and do that, it is just like you are taking a reference photograph and trying to make a painting. Okay, so that is realism. You are trying to make a photorealistic painting. So maybe your, your, your actual natural style is photorealism or hyperrealism. I was doing the same thing. You know, I used to get inspired by some artist and I used to try doing that. And then another artist and try to do that. And I thought that, oh, I am simply copying, but it is not copying. It is called as realism, photorealism, hyperrealism. Okay, yeah. that time I never had that thing in mind. Another thing I wanted to add here, a few days, I think yesterday or day before yesterday, one of my students said that another artist, I'm sorry, another person liked her painting and she wanted my student to paint a, uh, 
you know coming uh, work for for her and when my student said that you know it will cost them money okay she is not going to do it for free and the lady backed out okay mm -hmm. and she was my student for sharing this to me and i said that have a care a damn attitude you know when you are an artist you must have a care a damn attitude okay success care a damn failure care a damn just be fearless okay mm -hmm. uh, failures teach you as important things as success then success when a person is successful when a person is achieving a lot of awards and money and all those things a fame and all that that is boosting the artist career that is not teaching the artist something okay the failures they are teaching artist something yes the I failures agree. are super important if i am not facing failure i will never get that confidence to carry out okay if i cannot understand the value of you know doing mistake then actually i am stopping my own success so the students or anybody who is trying to stop failure is actually trying to stop success okay yeah. if i have a lot of knowledge of how to make a mistake or or how to get out of that mistake then only i can be super confident in my painting right so this is what i tell to all my students and also to upcoming artists that never ever care about failure failure should not be able to stop you from achieving anything right it is a part and parcel of your journey it is a unavoidable thing okay many artists they don't share their failure open in the public but that does not mean that they have not come across failure okay so if you are actually expecting your artist career to be super smooth then just go out of this artist thing and join something else and i'm very sure that wherever you are joining you will come across failure okay so yeah, yeah. failure is not failure if you don't give up it is just a part of the journey okay so this is my yeah. message to the upcoming artists no, i completely agree it's part of the growing process uh, and i've had many many failures over the years and i actually now put myself in position to confront failure so that the things happen i'll start off by not drawing or not even looking at the composition and to see if i could get myself out of the problem um by creating uh, situations where there, there's high high uh, possibility of failure i put myself in that position to learn i i in fact, i in fact take that particular project where the chances of failure is super high because yeah. that gives me a kick that gives me okay other person cannot do it so let me try because you know i really like to take up those challenges where the failure percentage is very high i really yeah. like to do that so when the students join into my course they uh, give their first few paintings like what they do and by looking at their painting i said wow this is going to be a challenge and when yeah. these students they make fabulous painting by the end of the course i really feel so good for them yeah so thank good. you so much angus it was so okay. nice talking to you yeah, i know to that you. other people are having a lot of questions for you so would you like if another person is asking you another question and you would like to answer or you would like to answer those things in your book what what do you think go for it go okay. for it <coughs> if you have any question to angus don't bother him too much be very precise respect his time but angus is approachable i am also approachable but i am not approachable for chit chat good morning good evening good night all those messages you yeah. can approach us with a logical very valid question and also before asking angus or me or to any of the senior artists please make sure that you have done your part of research your part of googling your part of hard work to figure out the solution to your problem and if you still cannot get the solution you can seriously approach angus or me okay i really don't uh, appreciate those type of questions like what is the best quality paper what is the best quality paint all these things are there on google you can please check out but if you have some serious questions which is bothering you then you can approach angus or me we are one of means angus and myself we are leaders of improve who have taken responsibility of improving world watercolor market 
and we are here to help you but no, don't bother unnecessarily we, our time is precious <laughs> right i am getting a lot of messages still when i am having this interview okay so thank you so much angus okay. i highly appreciate you giving 1 hour and 13 minutes for this okay. interview this is so valuable and crucial for the upcoming artists thank i you. hope everybody enjoyed it and um, and got some useful information out of it Thank Thanks you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so okay. much. It was such a good uh, feeling to have you on this interview. It is, it was so precious. Even my knowledge got a lot of improvements. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Appreciate. Bye -bye. It. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.